Welcome to Hochoka Podcast. A simple ashwood bow, a willow arrow. What can these two things teach us about life? Listen as Joseph Marshall III unpacks the power and beauty of the bow and arrow in a series of lessons here at Hochoka. Hello, Mitaki Api, and welcome to Hochoka, here at the center of St. Joseph's Indian School's campus. I'm Scott Wooster, today's Hochoka host. We're glad you've joined our circle with Joseph Marshall III. Joe is a frequent contributor to Hochoka, and we've invited him back this season to share wisdom from the traditional Lakota bow and arrow. Not only is he with us to offer these lessons to the audience, but also he is here for workshops with our students on traditional archery. Welcome back, Joseph. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to be back here. It's uh, and especially to talk about one of my favorite topics is uh, the bow and arrow, which has been part of my life since I was five years old. Absolutely. Yep. yep. The prompting should be easy today. Just uh, <laughs> just quick questions. Right. I'll get you. I'll get you going Hopefully, here. Yes. Yeah, it will. Uh, so. Um, this conversation's inspiration is the wisdom uh, of the bow and arrows, as you said, the Lakota bow right. and arrow, that uh, you imparted to our students in, in right. the last couple of days while you've been with them. Yes. And the wisdom from your book, which I think we have on the yeah. on the table yeah, here. Right. Uh, the Lakota way of strength and courage, lessons in resilience from the bow and arrow. And for our audience, uh, you said uh, since you were five, mm -hmm. how did it become uh, such a central way for you to make meaning of of life? Well, you know, uh, like any boy at that time uh, in the 1950s, any Lakota boy, I should say, mm. uh, I, I was interested in doing things outdoors mm -hmm. and hunting and those kind of things. And then when I was five, four or five, I saw my grandfather's bow and arrows for the first time ever. And of course, curiosity took, took a hold of me. And, and once he showed how to use them, then I was hooked. Mm -hmm. I, wanted, I wanted to shoot that particular bow, but he made one for me later on. And as an activity, bows and arrows have been part of my life for since that time. Mm -hmm since I was five or six, and I began to learn to shoot. But over time, as I grew older and became an adult, I, I realized that there was a definite connection between not only making bows and arrows, but using them and what, what a bow means and what an arrow means. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's how it became even more of a meaningful thing to me, not mm -hmm. just an object or to use to hunt or to recreate, but something that I could connect to what life is all about. Right. So you would see it as a boy as just uh, the, the, something maybe romantic right. or something. Something to play with. Yep, yeah, exactly. Something to get enjoyment out of. Yep. Right. And now it gives meaning to life. Exactly. Exactly. Um, there, there are five lessons that you talk about right. uh, that you learn from the bow and arrow. Right. Um, you, you've got trans, trans, uh, formation, transformation, right. simplicity, purpose, strength, Resilience. Resilience. And this is a quote from you. You say, the lessons from the bow and arrow are simple. Life is the bow maker. We are transformed by all of the mm -hmm. experiences we have, all of the choices that we make or are made for us, and even by those we don't make. Right. And so for this first conversation that we have, let's talk about the first of these, which is sure. transformation. Transformation. Um, you, you said this up in a chapter in your book on transformation that runs a little bit counter to to what we have in the dominant culture today. Mm -hmm. Can you just share that that story with us about White Wing, please? Sure. Uh, White Wing uh, was a young young man, boy, teenage boy, just on a verge of, of being a man. Mm -hmm. And he was an only child. And obviously, you know, the pride and joy of his parents. But at a certain point in his life, his parents began to realize that he was tipping a little bit toward being arrogant because he was tall, he was a good-looking young man, he could do things easily. So uh, when he compared himself to other boys and saw himself maybe as a little bit better than everybody else, mm -hmm. then, then, then that arrogance began to seep into his, his character and the way he looked at things. So uh, his parents 
needed to do something about that. I needed him to learn, but uh, because they were afraid that he would, you know, they would get out of hand, mm -hmm. that he would grow up learning the wrong kind of character or developing the wrong kind of character. So, so they talked to an old man, a medicine man, as it turned out, and who was, who was, who was blind. And they told him what they, what, what, what they were afraid of relative to their son. So the medicine man decided he would, he would help. So he took the young boy on a, on a journey, on a short journey, for, to, do a, to perform a task. And, of course, the young man did it because his parents asked him to do it. But he wondered what it was all about. He really wasn't enthusiastic about it, but he did it nonetheless. And so they took a long walk, essentially. And the old man said, this is what I want. I want you to help me find some stones. And so they walked and walked and walked and came to what is now the, the White River. We call it the White Earth River, Makrizi mm. Taska. And, and eventually he found the stones. But they have to be certain particular stones. They have to be round, perfectly round, and in graduated sizes. Mm -hmm. And he gave him a bag to put them in. So he went and found the stones. And hoping that that would be the, the end of the task and they would go home. But then the medicine man wanted to do something else. He wanted to go look for sweet grass. So they did that. And all the while, the boy is becoming impatient. He's thinking, well, this is, this is not fun. This, mm -hmm. is not, this is not the thing I want to do. Uh, so when they finally did start at home, he walked really fast and, you know, kind of really, you know, was really, his impatience won out and he left the old man behind. And lo and behold, he runs into a bear, and the bear chases him up a tree, slashes his leg and chases him up a tree, and he's safe in the tree. But then he, then he realizes, well, the old man is down there, and the bear is still looking around, and the old man is blind and can hardly see, and the bear is certainly going to tear up the old man. And lo and behold, <laughs> the bear does encounter the old man, and the boy is watching. Mm -hmm. And he's he's fearful of what's going to happen. He knows that the bear is going to tear the old man right. to pieces. And but that doesn't happen. The bear doesn't counter the man. The old man pulls out a vial and waves it in front of the bear, and the bear sniffs and turns around and runs off. And the and the boys the boys flabbergasted. How did that happen? You know, he's expecting the old man just to be shredded. Well, he gets down from the tree and and uh, goes to check on the old man and 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 uh, you know he he can't figure out what happened and said what 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 did you do what how did you do that mm -hmm. and in the vial is skunk oil and skunk oil is as a lot of us know is very very pungent and it's very offensive and. And some of us have had the unpleasant counter of being sprayed by a skunk, and we know what that's like. Mm -hmm. Well, bears are the same. Bears don't like skunks mm -hmm. because of their scent. So just to wave that scent in front of the bear's nose, which is very, very sensitive, by the way, did the trick. Yeah. So that's how the old man protected himself. And, of course, by this time, the young man is beginning to think, well, there's there's more to this old man than, than I realize, mm -hmm. you know, in his own you know, teenage way, uh, and and eventually they, they get home, and and then the boy teaches him about. He takes the four stones, and the old man teaches him what each of those stones represent, the stages of life. We start out as a, as a young person. We were born, and we became we become a child, and we become a young adult, and adult, and then old, old age. And you know, he, he equates that to the, the big stone. One is bigger than the other. Eventually, we reach the point where we're like the large stone, where it's 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 heavy, heavier than all the rest, heavier than all the rest put together. Not because at that age, when we get become old, we're we're still young and strong, but we're weighted down with experience and knowledge. Mm -hmm. That makes us heavier. So that's the lesson that that old man imparts to the young man, you know, over this trip. Mm -hmm. And the man 
later on, the old the, the boy learns later on that the, the the old man who said nothing of himself, that he's right. just an old medicine man living on his life. You know, he's half blind, and he, he learns that that man and his young. In his youth, was a formidable, formidable warrior, mm-hmm. but he never mentioned that, mm-hmm. and he kept silent about it. And, and so, that was the way that the old man, at the behest of the boy's parents, White Wing's parents, taught the young man humility. Mm-hmm. A very, very, you know, very simple way to do it. Yeah. Absolutely. And being treated by a bear would would teach you humility. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, for sure. Exactly. And in the book, uh, you say that silence is difficult to right. ignore. What What do you mean by that? Well, again, it's, you know, what the old man didn't tell about himself. Mm-hmm. That he didn't reveal that he was a really fierce warrior in his in younger days. Um, there, there was a ritual among the Lakota warriors that sometimes they would tell about their victories, so to mm-hmm. speak. It's called Waktogalaka. But some warriors didn't do that. They just, you know, were humble about it. So, and this is what happened in the case of this old man. He didn't tell about all his exploits. Mm-hmm. And, and he could he could that, he could have done that. But what, what it means is that what you don't hear is just significant, as significant as what you do here. Mm-hmm. And there are things that we do, a lot of us do in the past that contribute to our character and our experience and who we are. But those are just things that we don't need to tell the world about it. Right. It doesn't make it any less important. It doesn't make it any less impactive in our lives. Yep. It's just part of who we are. Mm-hmm. And you've said that before with with uh, your stories on Crazy Horse too. The, exactly. the humility of him, humility, yes, as a guy who never uh, never bragged, never bragged talked about, about his exploits. exploits. Yeah, exactly. No, yep, we're on the same page. Exactly. Um, so we're talking about transformation, and obviously the 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 young boy was transformed through the story, through the experience through with the, experience. the medicine man, right. through meeting a man. Of right. humility uh, and um, a man who, who was living his life, but but knew a lot of things and and like you said had had become at that stage in his life the, right. have the biggest stone weighed sure. down with experience sure. and all that. That's great. Um, you you have said before you heard, overheard a conversation uh, that was uh, happening with a group of elder men mm-hmm. in the shade of a cottonwood tree. This is right. back when you, you were a kid in the 50s. Right. Um, and they were talking about how Lakota culture was being transformed by events that were far beyond sure. anything that they could control sure. or that their ancestors could control as well. As you tell about their fears, which I'm mm-hmm. sure w- were huge at that time, and and chart the circumstances and events that brought about that cultural mm-hmm. transformation. Um, you talk about it. You actually juxtapose it with the transformation that happens to the ash tree right. in the hands of a bowmaker. Right. So we're we're making this leap from yes. their story to to this. Right. Right. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. The the thing the what the old men were talking about because in the 1950s these old men who were 70 years old in that age range uh, had been born just before the turn of the century. Mm -hmm. So their parents were of that generation that that engaged the white people when they came. Mm -hmm. And that was the start of that real forced transition of life onto a reservation and so forth. And they grew up witnessing the effect that, you know, that whole era had on their parents mm-hmm. and what it was doing to their generation yeah. and what it would do to the generations that followed. And they were afraid not all of it would be good. Mm-hmm. Not all of it would be, uh, you know, would, would that it would diminish the culture that, that they knew, that, that they knew still existed at that point in time yeah. in the 1950s. So when you correlate that to what happens to a piece of wood that we harvest, we split we split the wood for one thing, we tear the bark off, and then we carve it down to the shape of a bow. We keep carving it until it becomes a bow. 
and there's no guarantee that it's going to be a good bow mm-hmm. at all. We, 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 we use our skills to make it physically appear like a bow, but it all depends on how, how skilled the bow maker is, you know, how experienced he is and so forth. So that imparts into the bow. Mm-hmm. Just like whatever happens to us individually or collectively as a group, imparts it impacts what happens to us yeah it gives us that experience it gives us that character or it takes it away from us mm-hmm. so there there's there's definitely that cor- correlation that parallel if you will between what happens to a bow how it's shaped by the bow maker and what life does to us right that's what it's all about something's taken away but right. something is shaped something as well. is shaped so they can perform so it can be something else yeah yeah. Yeah, and sir, you you couldn't have had that insight in the fifties as a as a young oh, no. boy listening, right? I mean, that's no, something that you not came at all. To. I mean, I, yeah. yeah, as a kid of five or six years old, you you don't have those insights. Yeah. But if you remember the lessons, yeah, then after a point in time, hopefully as you get older and you gain some experience, then, then those lessons come back around. Yeah, and then it makes sense. Right, and and. I, per- personally, what I what hits me with that is that lesson is so powerful, you know. As I work with young Lakota men, not sure. Kota Dakota, but that is that what's been taken away. Uh, there's still something there sure. that's been there's transformed. Still something there. Exactly. And what are you going to do with that? How right. does how do right. you shape your own uh, bow? Exactly. Or, yeah, it's so powerful. That's right. great. So we all go undergo transformation in our Absolutely, lives. Absolutely, all everybody, the time. All the time. Um, through our experience. Uh, right. You, you have, uh, uh, you say the cautionary tale from the Lakota experience mm-hmm. is that we have choices to make. Right. right. And I guess we're kind of saying that, but can you expound on that just a little more? Sure. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's like somebody said, you know, there's always a fork in the road. Yeah. So it all depends on, you know, whatever the circumstances are at the moment, you decide to go one way or the other. But whichever way you go, it will have consequences because based on choice. Yeah. And it's like the bow maker saying, okay, well, I'm going to take a little bit more wood off here. But then the consequence of that, may, maybe I'm going to make the bow a little weaker. Mm-hmm. So, so the bow maker has to have some sense of what the bow, what's happening to the bow. Mm-hmm. And we have we should have that same sense when we face a choice. Mm-hmm. There will be consequences. Yep, yep, definitely consequences. Yeah, it's a yeah. great metaphor. I exactly. really I like that. Yeah. So and back to the book, the Lakota way of strength and courage. Um, you you end the chapter uh, on transformation with a, a story about Iktome. And, uh, you know, for our audience that might not know, you and I are both familiar with it, yeah. but Iktomi is a trickster in right. Lakota stories, right. um, but always with a lesson or moral. So whatever exactly. his antics are, exactly. he's, he's providing something to grow from. And sure. um, can you tell us that story about transformation with Iktomi? Sure. Like you say, Iktomi is, is, is a trickster, and he is a kind of a being that, thinks he's a lot more than he is. Mm-hmm. I mean, a lot of us go through that phase, right. probably. And uh, he's always hungry. He's always living in somebody else's house. And, you know, he's always looking for food and a way to get by easy. Mm-hmm. Uh, one day, he comes upon a pond, a really nice still pond in this meadow. And he bends down to drink water, and he sees his reflection in the, in the water surface. And he... You know, he's admires himself because he thinks, as I said, he thinks there's a lot more than he is, and he admires his face, and he, he's lays there looking down at himself for a while. And then he gets tired of it, and he leaves. He comes back the next day and decides, well, I'm going to go look at myself again. Mm-hmm. That was such a good experience, I'm going to do it again. Mm-hmm. This time it's a little windy, water's a little choppy, and uh, the image is different. The reflection he sees in the pond is different, so he wonders why. It's the same water, he's the same thing, being, but the image he's seeing is distorted. Mm -hmm. So he uh, wonders about that, and he is a little upset about it, and he decides to come back the next day. 
and and uh, give it another chance. This time it's slightly raining a little bit, you know, and the raindrops are hitting the hitting the water, and the image is even different than mm -hmm. it was the day before, and that puzzles him and that you know upsets him. You know, he, he wants to see himself the way he saw himself the first time. You know, that real admirable, mm -hmm. in his estimation, yeah. this admirable image. And so he come, becomes angry about it. He blames the pond. And uh, there's a rabbit nearby. And he's watching this happen. He's watching Ikotomi get upset and, you know, blaming and yelling at the pond. And the rabbit laughs at him. And Ikotomi says, why are you laughing at me? And he says, well... You're looking at it the wrong way, you know. It's you're, It's the same thing that you see. It's just that it's changed because of the, the wind and the rain and the calmness. That's why you're seeing two different things. And it's it's. And life is not always how you perceive yourself. Life is also in how others perceive you. And that's what transformation is. You know, we we, we change over time. But does that mean we appear or seem to others the way we seem to ourselves? Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's what life is all about. Right. You know. Yeah. Simple story, but I think very, very telling. We, you know, Very profound. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you for sharing. And uh, thank you for being on the show again today. And My pleasure. We'll, we'll join up again soon. Okay. Shall we? Thank you. And thank you to our audience for joining us here today at Hochoka at the center of St. Joseph's Indian Schools campus, where we talk about issues that are central to Native American education today. Until next time, stay centered.